Dear Father, we come to thee with full hearts this morning to praise thee and bless thee and thank thee for thine infinite wonder which has been manifested so marvelously this week. Father, I thank thee specially for the message thou art about to send and for all that Lily has been to us and specially for guiding her to give me this prayer which I know is sent to help everybody here. Learning Christ, teach, teach us, my Lord, to be sweet and gentle in all the events of life, in disappointment, in the thoughtlessness of others, in the insincerity of those we trusted, in the unfaithfulness of those in whom we relied. Let us put ourselves aside to think of the happiness of others, to hide our little pains and heartaches so that we may be the only ones to suffer from them. Teach us to profit by the suffering that comes across our paths. Let us so use it that it may mellow us, not harden nor embitter us, that it may make us patient, not irrit irritable, that it may make us broad in our forgiveness, not narrow, haughty and overbearing. May no one be less good for having come within our influence, nor any less pure, less true, less kind, less noble, for having been a fellow traveler on our journey toward eternal life. As we go our round from one distraction to another, let us whisper from time to time a word of love to thee. May our lives be lived in the supernatural, full of power for good, and strong in its purpose of sanctity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> I've been told that there have been a lot of inquiries about the little Bible, that I've been reading from this week from time to time. And uh, for those who are interested, I would like to tell you that it's the Runner's Bible. R-U-N-N-E-R apostrophe -N -N -E -R S, Runner's Bible. And it's by Nora Holm, H-O-L-M, and it's published by the Houghton Mifflin Company. Boston and New York, but I understand all the Baptist bookshops have it, and I'm quite sure any religious bookshop would get it for you. And the little dedication, I think, is so nice. It says, for him who must run and yet would read, and particularly for her who at 17 has already begun to run, these commands and promises of Holy Writ are gathered and grouped by one who, while running, has felt the need. I want to share one little bit from it with you this morning. It says, Ye that is greatest among you. <clears throat> I think this is a message for us to take home with us. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast passed it by thee. Never withhold just praise from him to whom it is due, nor from others concerning him. To do so is quite as dishonest 
as it is to withhold any of his material belongings. Also, any assistance that you can render to him belongs to him in the eyes of God, his Father and yours. It is imperative to obey every impulse to be kind, and you will if you truly desire to be in the service of the Father. Who knows but that you may have been delegated to answer someone's prayer. Never let a debt go unpaid, if it is possible to pay it. To do so is to encumber oneself and possibly add greatly to the burden of others. Own no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. For whatsoever shall, whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. And in whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. Let this benediction be in your heart, wherever you come into the presence of another, it will help greatly to bring him and you into sympathetic accord. Shun, <coughs> shun everyone while you feel irritable. Not only that, but the moment you feel irritability coming upon you, go into the secret chamber of your being and be perfectly quiet until the assurance takes possession of you that in heaven where you truly abide, everything moves in perfect harmony. Divine truth will banish the untruth of material threat. I would like for your meditation today, not your, your affirmation today, so many of you waste God's precious time running yourselves down and saying you're not serving him enough and you're not using your faith and you're not doing this and you're not doing that and having a wonderful time being thoroughly negative, concentrating every thought on yourselves. And it just won't work. You'll never be able to serve him more. You'll never be able to use more faith as long as you use that precious time of God's in running yourselves down. So I'm going to give you a little short affirmation today and I want you to remember that Jesus meant this for every one of you when he said, ye are the light of the world and ye are the salt of the earth. But I think if you just take that one, ye are the light of the world and go and shed his light in darkness and be a lighthouse for him you'll be spreading his kingdom in the most wonderful way. And I hope no one will ever say, I'm not serving God enough and I'm not using enough faith or run yourselves down anymore. So would you just say, it said like this, Jesus said, I am the light of the world and Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. So if he's the light of the world, you're the light of the world. But those are his words. Ye are the light of the world. So would you just say, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now don't any of you forget that. And uh, I think God wants me to tell you this morning, I've said it before, but I don't think we can say it too often, that as long as you do the next thing to the best of your ability, you are serving him as perfectly as it's possible to serve him. He wants those little tiny things done perfectly and I know that he wants me to tell you that a garbage collector collecting the garbage perfectly is just as wonderful in his service as the President of the United States. So don't think there's anything too small to do perfectly for God. A little boy was trying to help his father. He was up in the gallery of a church and the father got him to the pulpit. 
and he was just about to preach and he looked up and saw his little son with a pea shooter pointing down at the congregation and a whole line of peas all ready. And he stopped dead. And the little voice piped out, All right, Daddy, you go on now and I'll keep them all awake for you. I heard uh, that a minister said that he knew what a terrible state of tension the world was in because for ten years no one had gone to sleep in his church. And it must have been maybe the same minister who had a little son who said to him, Daddy, every time you start to preach, I say a little prayer. He said, that's wonderful, what do you say? He said, I say, now I lay me down to sleep. And I've heard, too, that there's so many multiple births now because the babies are afraid to come into this world all by themselves. <laughs> so I hope you'll all try to be less tense and make this world a better world for the babies to come into because we all love them so much. And I hope you'll remember to go beaming, beaming, beaming wherever you go so all these beautiful people in Cadillacs will wave to you and you'll get lots of new friends. <laughs> and don't forget your three psalms every day, 23, 91, 103. And don't forget that God wants morning, noon, and night to hear prayers from you. But that noontime... He just wants silent prayers and he doesn't want you to read or write or do anything else but just go down somewhere on your bed if possible like a rag doll and relax and just listen and listen to that still small voice and don't be like a woman who came the morning after I'd suggested this. She said, a most terrible thing happened to me yesterday. I said, what was it? She said, I just did what you said. I went down on my bed like a rag doll and I fell fast asleep. Wasn't that dreadful? I said, oh, that's just what God wanted you to do. And I hope that when that happens to you, that when you wake up, you'll just thank God that your body, which is his temple, has received just what it needs. I went in to a room just here this morning to telephone to someone, and in great big letters I saw just four words. And I think this was a message for me and for all of you. It had just got, Lord, slow me down. <laughs> so many of us are in such a hurry to get to places and we get our blood pressure up and an awful lot of tension when we find we're going to be a few minutes late. Well, I have proved over and over again that when we're going to be a few minutes late, when we've tried everything possible to be punctual, it's because God wants it that way. I'm thinking of the amazing time when I had the great privilege of having an interview with Alan Hunter in California. I expect some of you have read his writings. And we were really going to be quite late. And my hostess who was driving me was getting herself all worked up and I said, oh, pipe down, I'm sure this is God's will and everything's going to be fine. And as soon as we got there, Alan Hunter came out with a man and he said, well, you'll have to go now, this is my appointment. And before I could apologize for being late, he said, thank God you're late this morning. That man had a terrible need. And he's also got a wonderful scheme a little way ahead. And I want you to kneel down with me and pray. We, he said, this man has been sending thousands and thousands of eggs to Korea. And when these eggs hatch out, there are more eggs from the chickens and so on. And we thought it would make a wonderful movie for Walt Disney, that at the beginning there would be the little chicken in the egg, all darkness, feeling there was no God at all. And then the eggs would break open and the chicken would come out into the light and realize the wonder of God. And we prayed for that. And within a week, I was in Northern California, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and they asked me to speak there a few words in the open-air theater they had. 
And I felt led to tell them about this. And afterwards, a man came to me and said, Will you write all that down about Walt Disney and the eggs? I said, Yes, I'll be glad to, but why do you want me to do that? He said, Well, I just happened to be Walt Disney's brother-in-law. And I'm going to him for Thanksgiving, and I would like to take all that to him. You see the wonder of God? If I'd been punctual that morning, that wouldn't have happened. And how he has it all planned in advance so none of us need ever worry about what we have to do next. Because the moment God has got the next thing ready for us and ourselves sufficiently prepared to cope with the next thing, he brings it about. And I would like to repeat again what Dr. Albert Cliff said was the greatest spiritual discipline that we can have. And that is to remember just to say thank you to God every hour on the hour. As I told some of you, I know we'll be five minutes early and five minutes late. Some days we'll forget all about it. But God is a God of love and he'll know how you're trying. And it helps bring about a wonderful fulfillment to prayer. Some of you might very unexpectedly be called upon to go and help somebody you don't know. This is what happened to me in Vancouver when I had to meet Dr. Glenn Clark's secretary in the waiting room of the depot there. When I arrived, there was a woman in the corner sobbing her heart out. And Judy said to me, oh, Mary, look at that poor miserable woman. Couldn't you go and cheer her up a little bit? I said, well, with God's help, I'll try. And I went over to this woman and I said, excuse me, but could I help you at all? She said, no, certainly not. No one can help me. It's my nerves. And I came in here to take a sedative and instead of opening the bottle with the sedative, I opened a bottle of shampoo. I said, I said my goodness, did you drink the shampoo? She said, no, I just spilled it all over myself. I said, well, what are you crying for? You ought to be thanking God that you didn't drink it. And she said, well, my husband. I said, don't tell me you've got a husband. She said, yes. I said, well, is he an alcoholic or something awful like that? She said, no, he's a good husband. I said, and you're crying. When I think of the thousands of women who would give everything they've got to have a husband. <laughs> He said, well, he was driving the car. I said, oh, now, you're not going to tell me you've got a car as well as a husband. And you're crying. You ought to be thanking God that you didn't drink the shampoo, that you've got a wonderful husband, you've got a car. You ought to be brimming over with laughter and thanksgiving. She said, you're a Christian scientist. <laughs> I said, I'm certainly not. She said, well, you're mighty sweet. What are you? And I said, what am I? I'm nothing. I said, now you just quit crying and give me your name and I'm going to pray for you every morning. And she burst out laughing, gave me her name. I went back to Judy and Judy said, sit down there and tell me all you said to that woman. <laughs> well, that's just a little hint that if you find anybody crying, you can turn everything that they're crying about into something lovely. And I'm sure she went back to her husband a much better and more appreciative wife than she was before. <laughs> I feel that I want to tell you about when I went to speak on a radio station. This was in Topeka, and uh, as the minister, he was a Baptist minister, he was driving me away home again to Dr. Helsley's, and uh, I said, I'm so awfully glad that you're so interested in divine healing. He said, well, why wouldn't I be? I believe I had the most wonderful case of divine healing of any that I've ever heard about. He said, when I was born, I only had one tear duct. And for two years, my parents suffered as they watched my eyes. And the doctors came again and again, and they said nothing could be done about it. And one day, my Baptist grandmother went to my Methodist mother and said, now listen, if you would just pray to God about this, that baby's eyes could be made whole. And my mother said, not today. 2,000 years ago, that was possible. 
But my grandmother persevered and showed her in the Bible how Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever. How the prayer of faith can heal the sick. And they decided they'd go to the nearest church and see the minister about it. That was a Presbyterian church. So my Baptist grandmother and my Methodist mother went to see the Presbyterian minister and told him all about the baby. And he said that if you bring that baby tomorrow afternoon, we will have prayer and meditation. That morning, the doctor came and looked again and said nothing they'd done had been able to help that baby. And in the afternoon, those three gathered together just as Jesus wanted them to, two or three gathering together, and they prayed. The doctor was asked to come back again the next day, and he found that baby with two perfect tear ducts. And he said, I was that baby, and I want you to know that I have studied night and day all the years since I went to school, and I have no idea which of my eyes had the missing tear ducts. I think that's another very wonderful example of the wonder of God. I've got something open here from this little book, and I want to tell you how sometimes God needs our prayers. This was in California. A minister had said that he would like me to meet him, and he wished he could have me for lunch, but he had a meeting to go to, and he had telephoned as soon as the meeting was over. And I thought I'd do what I always tell everyone else to do and go down on the bed like a rag doll, and I did that. And then all of a sudden I got those words coming into my mind, not as you sing them, not the preacher nor the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. But it came like this, not the preacher nor the deacon, but it's thee, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's thee, it's thee, it's thee, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I thought, now whatever's happening, how can God be standing in the need of prayer? But I felt such an urgency to go to my hostess and ask her to pray with me. And I said, oh, please, let's go down on our knees. I feel it's so important I couldn't just do it lying on the bed like I can any other time. But let's go down on our knees and pray. And she said, oh, darling, are you ill? I said, no, I'm fine. It's God. And she looked at me, and but she went down on her knees, and we prayed, and gradually that Peace came to us, that peace which passes understanding. We felt everything had been taken care of. And I said, I know what it was. God had been shut out of that ministerial meeting somehow, and he just wanted us to pray him back into it. And I know he's back there now. And once again, I went down on my bed. But instead of going to sleep, I felt I had to write this. It seemed as if Jesus was speaking and saying... I am guiding, ever guiding, how they all fail me, fear and flee, far from my divine light into the darkness, black as night. I am calling, ever calling, but to me deaf ears they turn. Be on fire for me, dear child of God. Let my light within thee ever burn. I am waiting, ever waiting, close beside my loved ones, night and day. Won't you, but their thoughts are ever turning to false guides they find on life's way. I am loving, ever loving, for the God of love am I. Won't you turn to me more often? Won't you to my bosom fly? I am listening, always listening, to each heart's earnest plea, so full of self God's children are, with so little time for me, I am giving, always giving, of God's blessings rich and rare, but so very few are grateful, hardly any really care. Come, O oh come from earthly pleasure, rejoice in me, my peace, my love. For the greatest earthly treasures may never compare with those above. Take each promise I have made and claim the gifts I have for thee. 
give each one their rightful plea, but first and foremost, follow me. As I finished writing that, the telephone rang, and it was the minister to say the meeting was over and would I go to his home. And when I got there, I said, how did the meeting go? He said, well, it wasn't too bad. I said, what happened at quarter to two? That was just the time we were on our knees praying. He said, a most extraordinary thing happened at quarter to two. I looked at my watch at that time because I knew you were waiting for the phone call. And one of those men had taken over the meeting completely. He was dominating all the rest of us, saying things that none of us agreed with at all. And all of a sudden, a marvelous change came over him, and he said very gently, I know you're not agreeing with me, not one of you. So let's form a subcommittee to work this thing out, and I will not be on the subcommittee. He said that was the most wonderful thing that ever happened in any of our meetings. That man is always forming subcommittees. But he always insists on being the leader of the subcommittee. But this time he didn't even want to be on it. And that meeting finished up in the most wonderful peace and harmony imaginable. So when you get a feeling like that, just pray and get someone to pray with you for God to be able to go into the places where he wants to go into. I wonder how many of you have heard the story of the church. They, I heard it told by a Presbyterian Scottish minister in Buenos Aires, and he said it was in a very wealthy aristocratic church in Edinburgh, but it's in many other churches too that this could have happened. A colored man went into that church and after the Sunday service, he went to the minister and said, I want to join this church. And the minister thought, what will the Laird say and what will Mrs. McSquirtle and Mrs. McTavish and all the other Macs say if I let this man into my church? And so he said to him, you go home and pray about this for a week and come back next week and tell me if you still want to join the church. To his horror, he saw him in the front pew the following week. And afterwards, he went round to see him. And the minister said, Do you still want to join my church? Did you pray about this? He said, I prayed about it. But I don't want to join your church. Because the good Lord said to me, Don't you go to join that church. I've been trying to get into it myself for years. Well, time's up, so I'm going to finish up with a little something here that I do want to say to you all from the very bottom of my heart. It's folks like you who keep the old world smiling. It's folks like you who drive life's cares away. It's folks like you when trouble clouds are piling who always have some cheering word to say. Oh, what would folks like me, I wonder, do without the love and help of folks like you? And I pray that God will bless every one of you and that you will go on being loving and helpful to everybody. And I just want to remind you to let God be in your kitchen and in the office and everywhere. When Dr. John Gaynor Banks was staying with us, I said to him one day, John, I do all my cooking with prayer and pressure. He said, Mary, you left out praise. Always say prayer and praise and pressure. <laughs> and I want to finish up by saying, why worry when you can pray? <laughs> <laughs>